Hi there. Um, so my name's Simon Duffy. I'm the director of the Centre for Welfare Reform, and I also lead Citizen Network, which is a global cooperative and uh, one of the organisations behind Citizen Fest, which this talk is part of. And I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 crisis. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've seen governments do and what we've seen people do. And I'm going to talk also about what this crisis teaches us about the importance of basic income, which is an idea which I'll explain a little bit more about as we go on. But um, I'm mindful that not everybody uh, watching this film will be coming from the United Kingdom. So some of my stories and examples are definitely based in the United Kingdom. Um, many countries have responded to COVID better than the United Kingdom. In fact, I think there are very few countries who have done as poorly as the United Kingdom in responding to the COVID-19 crisis. So hopefully in your country, there may be things may be better than this, but I think it's very revealing. Um, and I think the lessons do go wider than the United Kingdom. Um, in the early days of the crisis from a UK perspective, what was clear was that um, there was just some sense of denial that this contagious, uh, infectious and dangerous virus was coming our way. Um, the idea that this virus was in China and that things were going on in China and that all looked very uh, concerning, uh, but it was certainly perceived as a Chinese problem, a Chinese virus, if you like. Um, a little bit later, when the cases of COVID-19 uh, seemed to radically increase in Italy and the uh, medical system in Italy started to come under extreme pressure, there was a little bit more awareness, but even then, for weeks and weeks, politicians were still treating this as something, a problem that would, was somewhere else. Um, and I guess that's natural enough. Um, but again, it shows you how in a world which is so interconnected um, and which is where diseases can spread as they always have through history, but we can discover that diseases are spreading and we can share information uh, very quickly and we can cooperate internationally. I guess the lesson is that we don't, we haven't woken up to how effective we could be if we really got our act together. Clearly, uh, Korea, China, Japan, countries that previously experienced the SARS virus, which was very similar, uh, were better equipped. So they, they knew what to do and they were much better at controlling the infections. Countries like the United Kingdom have actually made savings in public health and in the health service and stripped away some of the provisions that would have allowed us to respond more quickly. Um, so yes, we were not well prepared. What was slightly more worrying was that uh, in some of the early responses by government, you almost got a sense that um, they didn't really mind if people died from the virus. They, clearly the virus is much more dangerous for older people. There was in the right wing newspaper in the United Kingdom, which is called the Daily Telegraph, one journalist wrote merrily that, uh, well, the virus might help us with our social care problem. In other words, older people dying will reduce costs uh, and that will somehow be better. Um, and very quickly in the discussion, you realise that for political leaders, money, the economy, what they consider to be the economy, what they consider to be valuable, was much more at the forefront of their thinking than human lives. So uh, we had um, this notion of herd immunity was suddenly draw, drawn out, that somehow, well, if lots of people caught it, um, then that would be okay because they would get immunity. Now, bear in mind that I don't think at, even at this stage, and now we're, you know, many months, this is September now, uh, we know very little about um, immunity to this virus. Uh, so this is all wishful thinking. There was talk about shielding vulnerable people. Somehow they would be protected and shielding uh, people in residential care, which were perceived to be people who would um, be at very much greater risk. 
the frightening thing is that all of this was just talk. In the very early days when the government did start to panic, one of the first things they do was instruct hospitals to discharge patients uh, willy-nilly into residential care. Uh, so many of these patients would have been infected with COVID-19 and we saw, we've seen thousands of people die in residential care services because for all the talk of shielding, um, actually the government was, if you like, injecting the virus transmitted by people into the residential care sector. So this has been another very depressing side of the uh, response to COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. We, we can see that the government really doesn't seem to value the lives of older people, the lives of disabled people, the lives of people experiencing chronic illness, all the people who are most vulnerable were really put at greater risk through government policy. So that was a yeah, sad, uh, sad lesson. The other, the other really interesting thing, and again, I think for, for instance, many people in other countries will not really understand how centralized the United Kingdom is. So uh, we, although we have local governments, um, local government has very little power, it has no constitutional status in the United Kingdom, and it has very little finance, very little finance given to it from central government and very little self-generated finance. So it's a, it's a very thin veneer uh, of government. And um, since 2010, government, central government has targeted uh, its austerity cuts on local government. So local government has even got um, weaker and weaker over the last 10 years. Now, the thing is, when you look at crisis response, the one thing that's clear is that you need local capacity and local leadership. Um, we've already seen this in Asia where actually, you know, if you can organise effectively, then you can keep the virus contained in a smaller geographical area. But you need good local organisation to do that. Um, and this is something that the UK really doesn't have. So the fact that local government um, is very weak, has very few resources. The health service itself isn't accountable to local government. It's accountable to central government. All of these things further created problems. So there was um, very little capacity to do um, adequate testing, uh, and that remains a huge problem today. Um, and very little capacity for local authorities to take a leadership, to make decisions on their own, to get the necessary resources to act. Instead, you had central government behaving like it was going to be the solution to this problem. And again, this is the reverse of what you want in response to uh, a major pandemic. You want local power, local authority, local decision making, quick action. Instead, we got centralised power, slow responses, confusion, bureaucracy, and then very worryingly, a lot of corruption started to creep in. So as the government wanted to do things quickly, panicked, it uh, started to, government ministers start talking to their friends, their friends say, oh, well, we could do testing, we could provide you with equipment, we can, and suddenly millions of pounds starts going on to being transferred to private businesses with no capacity to really respond appropriately to the problems. I mean, an example of this was that the government managed to purchase a whole load of um, protective equipment, shields, all of the, the gloves um, from Turkey, from a t-shirt manufacturer who had no experience. Eventually, when these, these supplies were talked about on the, in the news media as, as coming and this is meant to be good news, when they finally arrived, they weren't fit for purpose. Um, so this is what you get with incompetent bureaucracy making decisions, politicians in a hurry making decisions they're not competent to make. The people who know about protective equipment in the health service and local government don't have the power, don't have the authority, don't have the resources. And so the, the response is being driven by the wrong people. So this is, um, you know, this has been a repeated pattern and there's been no, no real change so far in, in that in the United Kingdom. Um, so lots and lots of problems. That's, so COVID-19 in a way has really shone a a sharp light on the kind of structural incompetence of the United Kingdom. 
and uh, and I think like the United States has not done terribly well. The president of the United States, Donald Trump, has been uh, clearly incompetent and out of his depth. The response to COVID has underplayed the seriousness of the problem. But the United States um, has states, and those states have authority, and a lot of the good practice comes because states and counties can act. And similarly, Germany and Iceland and everywhere really in the world has better central local government relationships and greater clarity and, and more local services that it can call on. Um, it's clearly very important that central government takes a lead, but it's really important that, that central government also allows leadership to be in place right across our communities. So we, we really saw a vacuum of local leadership, um, good people in those local communities, don't get me wrong, good people in public services, but really not having the authority to make decisions um, and not having the resources to uh, empower those decisions. Those are some of the negatives. In a way, what we learned was government, our government was not equipped. It was clear from some of the reporting that the government also thought that we, the people, would be incompetent. Um, a, lot of, a lot of discussion that uh, if, if lockdown arrangements were put in place, we'd all break them because, you know, we couldn't cope. And um, this is, um, it's not surprising maybe that people who have a lot of power and think that they're right to have that power have a very low opinion of ordinary people. But again, what we saw was the opposite of what they believed. In fact, ordinary people have been generally very responsible. Uh, lockdown was followed very well. A lot of self-discipline by ordinary citizens and that continues to be the case despite a kind of constant confused messaging from central government, which probably is actually making things a bit harder now because nobody's really clear what they should or shouldn't be doing. And again, if you've got messaging coming out centrally and then very, very weak systems locally, you can't really get your messaging right for the kind of problem that you've got. So, um, yeah, we government doesn't trust the people. Um, but the people really did a great job. One of the most important things that happened, and I think that this, we hope, I think many of us, that this could be a real turning point in, in the development of uh, our society, is that communities just got themselves organised. Um, hundreds of thousands of communities just got themselves organised. People used Facebook and WhatsApp, I think primarily, other. Uh, social media as well, but those seem to be the two main ones. So Facebook provided people to create ways of coordinating at a local level, at an area level, at a kind of regional level. So groups start to communicate, self-organised groups. Local people start to take responsibility. Um, leadership starts to emerge in streets, in neighbourhoods. People start to check out whether people are all right. Little WhatsApp groups come up, people start asking for assistance, volunteering assistance. An enormous um, wave of energy. Again, it was really striking that central government at the same time was putting a lot of emphasis on the need for volunteering, but it said the way to volunteer is to go, on, uh, go online and volunteer for the NHS volunteering scheme. This has been um, a disaster. I think three quarters of a million people, I believe, signed up for this. And I've spoken to many people who never did any actual volunteering. There were weeks of training that led to nothing because by the time, again, this is a classic problem, by the time that they had been trained to assist and gone through all the hoops, actually that things had moved on, they weren't needed. What the government had trained them for wasn't what actually needed to happen. The great thing about mutual aid, of course, is there's none of that. People are helping each other out as neighbours. People are not only responding sensitively and quickly to things that are pro immediate problems to them that they can see or that their neighbours can see, but they're also building relationships through this process, aren't they? 
Whereas in the government scene, when it did work, what it meant was that you would somehow volunteer to do some task that you'd been informed was needed on a mobile phone. Um, and you're doing that task completely disconnected from the social rela relationships, completely disconnected from your particular neighborhood. So again, what you see is a kind of like a, a lumpen kind of giant state trying to help people be neighbors, help people volunteer. But those are micro tasks. Those are things that can only really happen at the level of the individual and the level of the neighborhood. When, when the state tries to organize them, it just ends up with disorganization. The response of local government generally, I think, um, to all of this, it was uh, much better than the central government. And uh, certainly places I know like Barnsley were very sensitive. Uh, Barnsley is a town in the north of England. Local leaders were very clear there that they needed to support the community action, encourage community action, enable that, not get in its way. Um, civil society, what we might think of as the traditional charities, community organisations, the organised bit of community life, um, also I think has generally been very helpful. Although it's interesting, I think, that they have struggled also to just let go. Um, what you see sometimes is, I think in Sheffield I saw an instruction which was you know, you can volunteer for these kind of things if you are uh, an accredited volunteer um, because you'll be insured. But don't do those kind of things if you're just doing it um, on your own. Well, of course, I don't think that's how neighbourliness works. <laughs> I don't think we police check ourselves. We have to trust ourselves. Um, and I don't think we're going to get the most out of people if we push them through these kind of hoops, even if they're a bit smaller and a bit quicker than the government hoops. Really, what communities demonstrated they could do, wanted to do, had the capacity to do, was just help in an ordinary, ordinary way. So that's been amazing. And uh, there are a lot of things that this can teach us. Um, and I want to draw attention to two things. The first thing is what I would call neighbourhood democracy, the need for neighbourhood democracy. Um, the Centre for Welfare Reform, I think, which is a, is a think tank based in the north of England, uh, I think for us this is the key to transforming public policy um, over the next uh, 50 years. And I hope we can move things along quickly, but uh, of course there's a lot of resistance to these ideas. But ultimately what we need to see, I think, is the reorganisation of power on a neighbourhood level. Neighbourhoods, which could be thousands of people in some parts of the world, already do have kind of that level of power. But in the UK, um, unless you're very lucky, what you find is there is really no structures between you as a citizen and the local authority, which as I describe is a very weak bit of local government, Local uh, average size of a local authority in the UK is a quarter of a million. So you've got you, a little bit of weak government that's responsible for a quarter of a million people, and then you've got central government, which is responsible for, um, well, 60 million. We do have devolved governments in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And again, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have all actually performed better than England, where uh, devolution is less well developed. So I think we need to see a significant shift in power and thinking to a neighbourhood level and really democracy at the neighbourhood level. I think it's a really interesting question to ask, why do we not have the right as citizens to make decisions about what goes on in our immediate neighbourhood? We, In the UK, we can control next to nothing of what goes on in our communities. Um, we are effectively disenfranchised from our communities. And I think if you think about that gap, I mean, it's really the gap between oligarchy and democracy. It's the, really the gap between living in a society where power is really in the hands of a small number of people. You might be able to vote for them every few years, choose your preferred powerful person, uh, but really that's the kind of politics we have. Or something which is actually closer to real democracy, where people sit together, talk together, decide together, 
vote on things that they need to vote on, cooperate together. Really, that's what we need in the 21st century, I think. Real democracy, real democracy. And, um, and that has to be fundamentally a kind of neighbourhood democracy. Of course, it's, it's more layered than that. We live in a complex world and we need to have uh, constitutional systems nationally and internationally as a kind of bedrock. We need human rights and we need systems to support those human rights. Uh, we need systems of governance and uh, checks and balances and an independent judiciary, independent media, all of these things are necessary. And, and in the UK, we, we're very weak on all of those things. So there's a lot of work to do at that level. There are fundamental economic problems that are also need to, to be addressed. Um, the UK is incredibly uh, divided economically. Um, London, the ec economics of London is, is really, London is, is like a super wealthy oil state and then other parts of the country are, uh, their economies are equivalent to economies in Eastern Europe that are still recovering from the communist era. Places like where I am are really equivalent to countries like Lithuania and Estonia. Places, Sheffield is in the north of England, which really built the Industrial Revolution, um, used to be a wealthy place. Uh, that wealth has disappeared. The industry has disappeared and the power to to change things, to turn things around has disappeared because that power is primarily in London. So we, we live in this very divided world and the economics doesn't really support people to be citizens. It doesn't provide people with the kind of security we need. And, and that is where one of the other really important lessons um, of this COVID crisis comes in, which is around the need to provide people with economic security. Um, Interestingly, my city, Sheffield, was also the first place where we set up, um, and I was one of the co-founders, but some other folk that really led this called UBI Lab Sheffield. So that's Universal Basic Income Lab Sheffield. And we were working to try and get the city to support the idea of making sure that everybody had a basic income. Basic income really means everybody gets some money, unconditionally, it's your money. Uh, enough to live on and then you can you pay taxes as you earn more money um, but you you're guaranteed that money and uh, you don't have to jump through any hoops it's your money this uh, the covid crisis really created an opportunity to get this idea on the agenda as well so i think this has been very exciting when we started there were four ubi labs in the country there are now 28 UBI labs. Why are people um, getting excited about this? Uh, I mean, I think there are three things. Basic income is an idea whose time has come. Uh, we call it in, in the UK, some of us call it, it's this generation's National Health Service. The National Health Service was an achievement of the 1940s, which happened after World War II. It was very much something, you know, my granddad is a working class man in Manchester, talked about it as a really exciting development that meant that he no longer could, had to fear for himself or his family. Uh, it was really kind of almost a prize that was won from the horrors of World War II. Um, it's universal, it's guaranteed, it's high quality. Income support, the, what we need to eat, to live, to buy clothes, to just look after ourselves to take care of those we love. Uh, income security is really absent and uh, it's heavily means tested, very punitive. Poverty is growing, inequality is growing. And moreover, the whole economy has become more and more fragile. So this idea is an important idea. It's an idea that many of us are excited about. Many people have been talking about it for a while, Centre for Welfare Reform supported it over the last 10 years. But now, um, suddenly again, that light of COVID has shone clearly on how fragile our economy is. Um, again, the government's response has been very confused. Um, many people would describe it as generous in a way. In the end, they, they threw, they've thrown billions of pounds at furlough schemes 
But again, what they've done is they've, they've actually, they haven't trusted people. What they've done is they've invested in businesses. So the bigger your business, the more unequal your salaries, the more money you get out of the system. If you're, a, if you're a small business or you're self-employed or you, you haven't made it onto any kind of salary, you get nothing. Um, and so the people who need the money most are least likely to get it. The people who don't need the money are most likely to get it. And, um, and, and the whole, and we're, and we're about to enter a, a really severe, well, we're in a severe economic crisis, although I think people are not fully aware of how bad it's going to be. I think there's a kind of still this sense that, oh, well, we just get through this and it'll be back to normal. That's not how economies work. The level of debt, the level of inequality, uh, the level of economic um, fragility and poor confidence will have skyrocketed as we come through this process. And so we will find ourselves in more and more need of economic security. And so I think this is going to be another driving pressure to see um, that, that will encourage people to um, embrace the idea of basic income. And, and, and now we have in the UK, um, many political parties support the idea. So the Liberal Democrat leadership supports basic income. The Scottish National Party supports basic income. Many in the Labour Party support basic income, although the leadership has yet to say that it supports it. Only the Conservative Party is clearly against basic income. And um, so we're in a very interesting position politically, which was not how basic income was perceived 10 years ago. Um, but the third thing, again, I think that is very interesting about this is I think the UBI Lab network, uh, which we've helped develop, is a good example of, again, like mutual aid, of how good ideas can suddenly become popular ideas, can suddenly become better understood ideas, because we as citizens can start to get our act together, start to share information, start, start organising webinars and presentations ourselves. What we're seeing is leadership emerging all around the country, and by collaborating and sharing what we've learned from each other, we make the possibility of change that much faster. So, for instance, the group uh, developed a emergency basic income proposal, which then got support of tens of thousands of people in petitions, and that went to parliamentary discussion. We were unsuccessful, but again, the idea was in the newspapers, it was on the parliament floor, and it, which it hasn't been for years. Um, we've now got councils, that's local authorities, accepting the case for basic income. The Scottish Government has made a clear commitment to, to testing basic income. Uh, the Welsh Government and, gov and local authorities in Northern Ireland are also very interested. So suddenly getting um, regional and national government leadership on the issue that we haven't had before. And where does this really come from? Well, it's driven by uh, passionate leadership from communities um, and UBI Lab Network is a partner of Citizen Network and uh, we're working with our friends in World Basic Income who are also a member of Citizen Network to try and really get this idea and this approach to driving change to spread as fast as we can um, because uh, it may not be in the United Kingdom which is after all a very right-wing government and uh, which has still got a large majority so these changes might not happen in the United Kingdom first, but they will change. They will happen because the world economy needs it. And the COVID crisis is underlined in the starkest terms that the old economic model doesn't work. The old political model doesn't work. Giving power to central government and sucking power out of the lives of working citizens doesn't work. Um, we need to we need to embrace our own citizenship. We need to shift power back into neighbourhoods, we need to get involved as citizens and we need to reassure each other through mechanisms like basic income and other good public services that we will take care of each other. Because that's the thing, we can take care of each other. That's not a problem. It's just the commitment to do so and the honesty and the integrity to follow through on those commitments and to create real social systems that support us all to be active, full, equally valued citizens. Thanks a lot.